Welcome back, everybody, to part four of this reaction series to Extra History's Teddy Roosevelt Trust Buster. Uh, so I've gotten a couple of questions from folks about the Sherman Antitrust Act, which is something that's been referenced often in this series because it's been the basis of some of what the government is doing to take down the trusts that we're talking about here. And uh, somebody asked me, they said, uh, does that Sherman have anything to do with General Sherman, William Tecumseh Sherman from the Civil War. Well, it kind of does. And so for those of you who aren't familiar, uh, William Tecumseh Sherman was actually raised in a um, political family early on. He grows up, he was born in Lan Lancaster, Ohio, not to be confused with Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Those are the ways those are pronounced, depending on where you live. Uh, Lancaster, Ohio, right outside of Columbus. And at an early age, uh, Sherman uh, loses his parents, and he ends up going to live with the Ewing family. Well, uh, Ewing was also his uh, foster father, was also a senator, um, or was a senator, I should say. And uh, so there's a lot of political um, kind of upbringing, not only in his re uh, biological family, but also his foster family. Long story short, General Sherman's brother, John Sherman, uh, in 1860 is elected to the Senate out of Ohio, the U.S. Senate. And so from 1861 to 1897, John Sherman, uh, General's brother, was a senator from Ohio with the exception of four years in the middle of that when he serves as the Secretary of the Treasury uh, for President Rutherford B. Hayes from 1877 to 1881. Uh, in 1897, he finally and permanently leaves the Senate uh, after 30 year, 32 years in the Senate to serve as William McKinley's Secretary of State for a couple of years. And that was kind of where his career ended. But that's who the Sherman Antitrust Act is named after, is General Sherman's brother, John. All right, let's go ahead and dive into part four. If you didn't see the first three parts, there's a link in the description below, as well as a link to the original content creator. Make sure to support them. The House of Representatives, February 28th, 1906. Theodore Roosevelt's new pet legislation, the Hepburn Bill, has just passed the House. The act prevents the kind of behavior Standard Oil and the railroads engaged in to create monopolies and control prices. Justice Department lawyers are still fighting for standards breakups in the courts, but Roosevelt has realized that's not a productive avenue. So you notice he said the House of Representatives passed that. And we've already talked in previous episodes about the way things work in the United States. You have, at this point in history, senators who are uh, elected by the state legislatures in their states. They're not directly elected by the people at this point. This will come a few years later with a uh, constitutional amendment. The House of Representatives, they are elected by the people every two years. So the House tends to be much more in line with the politics of the moment, uh, with the prevailing political viewpoints by people. So they're going to be a little ahead of where the, the Senate is. And so with all the public outcry over Standard Oil and its practices and trust in general, you're going to see a lot more movement on that in the House of Representatives and a lot less movement in the Senate. They'll never catch everyone. To break the power of the trusts, Roosevelt can't rely on prosecuting illegal behavior after it's occurred. He has to prevent it with legislation. But the progressive-leaning House of Representatives isn't the real fight. That'll happen yep. in the more conservative Senate, where Roosevelt will have to broker deals and make alliances to get the bill through, including with the congressman he hates most. Thanks so much to Audible for helping make our extra history. Audible's awesome. Fun. I can't wait until the day that I get sponsored by them because I love Audible. And I would love nothing more than, than for them to give me just, you know, I'll give you free ads on my channel. Just give me a lifetime membership to get as many Audible books uh, as I can. In 1906, Theodore Roosevelt gave a public speech discussing the role of journalism in the progressive movement. Illustrating the good and ill of crusading journalism, he compared them to a character from the philosophical novel Pilgrim's Progress, who used a rake to clear away muck. The men with the muck rakes are often indispensable to the well-being of society, Roosevelt said. But only if they know when to stop raking the muck. <laughs> this speech showed Roosevelt's sometimes rocky relationship with the progressive press, who always pushed him to go further, but who he was also happy to cultivate and promote if it served his purposes. 
indeed political cartoons of the day, cast Roosevelt as a crusading king, surrounded by knights representing prominent journalists and publications, with Ida Tarbell as Joan of Arc. So, you know, a lot of people have this idea of Theodore Roosevelt as the the you know all-time great american like he's the tough guy the guy who killed bears with his bare hands and hunted down people who stole his boat and those kinds of things and he was all of those things he absolutely was but he also was a very shrewd politician who knew how to play the game of politics he knew how to cultivate public opinion he knew how to schmooze the right people to get what he needed to get done Uh, he knew how to kind of you know manipulate and um, you know shape things uh, to his will. The speech also gave Americans a new term for these investigative story-breaking journalists, muckrakers, a label for what it's worth that Ida Tarbell hated. However, she was not the only investigative journalist taking on corruption and big business. In the same issue where she began her series on Standard Oil, her McClure's colleague Ray Baker took on the use of intimidation and violence by labor unions against their own members. But it was Baker's investigation into a minor worker's strike in Colorado that first brought him Theodore Roosevelt's attention. There, corporations, crooked politicians, and banks had ostensibly squeezed the miners' union on the issue of working hours until they'd ignited a full-on revolt with miners bombing company mine shafts and beating or assassinating new workers brought in to replace the strikers. Can we just not kind of gloss over the fact that they just said beating or assassinating the what we call scabs, the people who came in to break the strike and work in their behalf? This is ugly stuff. I mean, this was violent stuff. You think that politics is ugly today and you think that um, you know that what you see on the news every day is something new. It is not. The governor, a banker himself, declared martial law and brought in the army. They arrested miners without warrants and threw them on deportation trains. One soldier threatened a judge with a bayonet outside of his own court. Baker, imminently fair, charted how foul play on all sides had escalated the conflict yep, and both shared sides. his article with Roosevelt before publication. Roosevelt liked the piece so much, he wrote a statement endorsing the article. And that collaboration would not be their last, as the young president and crusading investigator found their interests aligning again the next year on the issue of railroads. Baker's next article examined how the railroad trusts, many partially owned by titans like Rockefeller, Carnegie, and J.P. Morgan, used lawyers and corporate structures to skirt the new laws against rebates and still offer discounted rates to favored big businesses. Baker pointed out that this was particularly unfair, considering that the government had literally given the land to railroads in order for them to lay track. That's true. I mean, if you look back in the 19th century when the railroads were expanding and connecting the country from the Atlantic to the Pacific and culminating with that big moment when Ulysses S. Grant is present, not the version that you see in the movie Wild Wild West, but similar, um, where he's present when they go to Promontory, Promontory Point, Point, Utah, and they connect the tra- first transcontinental railroad. A lot of this was subsidized by the government. And there was a ton of corruption that went on with that gov- those government subsidies. And so this is nothing new, but these very companies that were propped up and built up and, and enabled by the government are now the ones that are flaunting uh, the rules right in the government's face and going around them. If it was a public service, it should serve the public good. Once again, Roosevelt got early access to Baker's research, passing it on to the Interstate Commerce Commission and progressive lawmakers to begin crafting what would become the Hepburn Bill. Now, without getting too technical, the Hepburn Rate Act, named after the man who introduced it, would empower the ICC to regulate railroad shipping rates in the interest of leveling the playing field for businesses small and large. Going beyond rebates, the Hepburn Bill allowed the ICC to look at railroad companies' books and made it illegal to give out free passes to other companies' goods. And crucially for Rockefeller's business, it also covered pipelines. So, you know, we we talk a lot about capitalism in America and how America was built on capitalism, but this is very much an anti-capitalist viewpoint here. I mean, this is the government getting directly involved 
in how companies can run their business and how they can set their prices. And this all still, you know, a lot of this stuff exists today. So it is not unfettered capitalism in the United States. And a lot of that goes back to these things that were happening. Now, I'm not making a judgment on whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. I think we could probably all at least agree that the government ha should have some degree of involvement in this stuff. But to what degree is really the question uh, and the debate that has gone on since the beginning of time. It passed the House of Representatives, where progressive Republicans were a major force without amendment and barreled onto the Senate, where it hit a brick wall. Because there was one group that did not want this to pass, the conservative wing of Roosevelt's own Republican Party, many of whom who had taken campaign contributions and personal free passes from the railroads. Chief among them was Republican leader Senator Nelson Aldrich, who was well known for killing progressive legislation that would impact big business. And, you know, I don't want to get too much into this, and I, I intentionally stay away from modern politics on this channel, but this is just one of many reasons why when people talk about things like party switches, you can't just say that happened because there's so many layers to this, okay? The, the part, political parties, we have a two-party system in America, which right now is Republican and Democrat, occasionally have more. And I think we would all benefit from a multi-party system, but that's just not the way things are right now in this country. Um, but it is not as simple as saying, oh man, the Republicans of today were the Democrats of yesterday. Because even back then, you had progressive Republicans like Roosevelt, you had conservative Republicans who were pro-business. They were still conservative, but they're pro business and things like that. And then you still have Democrats who are primarily at this point in the South. Um, so there's multiple layers to all of this. And there was no strict party switch. There are elements of things that have evolved and changed over time, certainly. Um, and one could argue that in some ways the, the conservative party of that time was the Democrats, but there was also a strong conservative Republican uh, component. It's very, very multi-layered and, and deep and complex. And we've had multiple what we call party systems over time. We're like in the fifth or sixth party system at this point. The parties will change. 20 years from now, the parties will look very different than they do today. 100 years from now, they may look completely different than they do today. They may not even be parties as we know them today. Who knows? Having previously monkeyed with tariff rates to please the Sugar Trust, he also personally owned part of Rhode Island's trolley system until earlier that year he sold it to a railroad trust for an enormous profit. Aldrich and his conservatives attacked Roosevelt as a secret socialist, tying him to the furthest left elements of the party who wanted to nationalize the railroads. Sound but familiar? In addition to refusing to pass the bill, Aldrich decided to hobble it further by delegating leadership on it to a prominent Democrat and the Senator Roosevelt hated most, Pitchfork Ben Tillman. Now, it's really hard to understate what an odious figure Benjamin Tillman was. Called Pitchfork Ben for his fiery speeches, Tillman rose to prominence during the fall of Reconstruction, when he led a paramilitary terrorist militia called the Red Shirts in a campaign of ballot box stuffing, voter intimidation, and murder against South Carolina's black community. And we're gonna, I'm working on the very early stages of my script for a Forgotten History uh, episode or maybe even a series on Reconstruction. Reconstruction's uh, a topic that doesn't get talked about enough but it's one of the ugliest and darkest chapters in American history. Um, you know, honestly, between what was done to freed men and women, uh, former slaves in the South uh, in the latter half of the 19th century, combine that to what was going on with Native Americans at that time. And honestly, you could argue that the darkest days of American history, the, the, the worst stains on our country uh, as a people uh, happened in that 40 or 50 year stretch after the Civil War, uh, or including the Civil War, if you will. Uh, and this guy was a big part of that. A vocal proponent of the idea that African Americans must either be subservient or exterminated. He was for decades the most open white supremacist in Congress. And just for the record, in 1906, that's really saying something. He and Roosevelt loathed each other. In 1901, Roosevelt invited African-American yep. educator Booker T. Washington to formally and publicly dine with the Roosevelt family at the White House. First time. The first time a black man had done so. 
people will automatically argue, wait a second, you know, Abraham Lincoln had Frederick Douglass to the White House. Yeah, but it was always kind of a low key thing when other, this was not the first time a black person went to the White House as a guest. It's the first time a president made a big deal about it publicly and really kind of embraced this and wanted people to know it was happening and went out of his way to show it. Uh, this was a big, big deal. Tillman's response to this act was so racist that I'm not even going to repeat it here. But I'll put it up here on the screen so you get an idea what kind of man this guy was. Horrible human being. Just disgusting. Yeah. <laughs> Their relationship deteriorated further the next year when Roosevelt withdrew Tillman's invitation to a White House dinner Good. after he'd punched a fellow senator on the floor of Congress. And look, we could go on all day about how awful Tillman is, but ultimately this is an episode about railroad trusts, and I'm pretty sure by now you get how bad this guy sucked. But as much as Roosevelt hated Tillman, he was also a major opponent of the trusts. In fact, he was part of the Democratic bloc, attacking Roosevelt for not going after the trusts even harder. Despite their mutual distaste, Roosevelt reached out to Tillman, opening a channel of communication to negotiate on the finer points of the bill. And this is another example of why you just can't say that there's been a party switch because this is actually still a position uh, and a philosophy that I think is largely embraced by the Democratic Party, which is the idea of regulating business and you know things of that nature. And, and you know, whereas the Republicans are going to tend to be more about deregulation and, and opposing those kinds of things. And so that's actually still largely true. So there's elements of all of that. That's why... I, I abhor when people say there was a party switch. You can't just say that. It's way more complicated than that. Things didn't change between them. In fact, they never met in person, instead talking through a go-between. But they did work together as Tillman steered the bill through committee. Meanwhile, Roosevelt continued meeting with Ray Baker, getting his opinion on the legislation. Baker, to put it mildly, wasn't happy because the Hepburn bill was mostly concerned with regulating maximum shipping rates, ensuring railroads couldn't jack up prices on the smaller companies. But Baker argued the real problem was the minimum rates, because while raising rates got everyone's attention, it was the fact that the railroads played favorites by lowering rates for big companies that created unfair competition. He also showed Roosevelt how the railroads nickel and dimed smaller shippers by charging them more for elevator services, storage, refrigeration, and chronically underweighing shipments from favorite companies. In fact, at this point, Baker pushed Roosevelt so hard to go even further than he was that the president became annoyed with him. <laughs> sure, he knew his ideas were good, but he also knew they wouldn't pass Congress, especially in his Tillman alliance. And this is again showing the brilliance of Roosevelt that He's not going to let the emotion of all of this get the best of him. He's going to be practical and say, you know, listen, I want to go after these guys. I want to do the right thing. But I also recognize there are limits to how far we can push this. And he, he kind of has to deal it for, with it from both ends. He's got the conservatives in the Republican Party who are pushing back against anything being done. He's got the liberals in the Republican Party, the, the more progressive, who want to push things. He's got the Democrats saying, you aren't going nearly far enough. And he's got to try and balance all of this and try to find something that he can get done. But Roosevelt's attempt to reach across the aisle failed. Tillman couldn't rally enough Democratic support to pass the bill, even combined with the Senate's progressive Republicans. Their partnership fractured, their relationship even worse, and Roosevelt back at square one. If he wanted to do anything, Roosevelt realized he needed a middle way. Because on one hand, he had Democrats and progressive Republicans who wanted to nationalize railroads, a solution conservatives would not accept. And on the other, he had conservatives that wanted to do nothing. So he started fresh, reverting back to the original bill before it had been augmented with amendments suggested by Baker, Tillman, and pretty much everyone else. It was a simpler bill, one that did what Roosevelt wanted, but was much more moderate. It passed. Sure, it was full of loopholes and extraneous amendments and would need to be strengthened in 1910, but Roosevelt... And those amendments were probably things that were little favors to people. You know, when you're trying to get enough votes together to make something pass and you might find yourself a couple votes short, sometimes you got to throw a bone here and there to people to get things done. It sucks, but that's politics. Roosevelt had done what was previously thought impossible, to restrain a trust not just with the courts, but with preemptive legislation. 
Even Tillman set aside his qualms and voted for it. And that was good, because even as Roosevelt celebrated his latest victory against the trusts, a new book had come out detailing shocking abuse, danger, and monopoly in another American industry, mm. the slaughterhouses of yep. Chicago. Meaning, oh yeah, that's something I learned a lot about in school. Roosevelt's next task was to take a cleaver to the meat trust. The meat trust. All right, so we'll get into that one tomorrow. Let me know your thoughts. Use the comment section below. I have a feeling there's going to be a lot of comments because I dove into a little bit of politics today. But uh, please keep it civil. Please uh, keep it friendly. I have no problem bringing out the delete button if I have to, if you can't do that. So thank you in advance, and we'll see you again tomorrow with the next episode. Thanks for watching.